Hey there, folks. Welcome to this episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor, and today I am joined by Aaron Marcus, who is a founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business. Aaron, how are you today? I'm awesome and very excited about our conversation here. Me too. One of the cool things about, well, A, in our pre-roll, I've just loved like chatting with you. Um, you've got a very unique background of experience that has led you to the consulting work that you do now. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and then uh, we'll fill in the blanks. Awesome. Awesome. So the the official current fancy worded paid to have someone help me write it version is as founder and CEO of Conquer Business, I help entrepreneurs get the financial and emotional freedom they need to build a business and a life they're proud of. Hmm. The unofficial version is I finally figured out what my random nothing to do with each other extensive experience background came together to help people do right <laughs> isn't that how that works right if you, you get older you find yourself like oh so this is why that all happened and and that's what that is and I I say it starts with my upbringing in Chicago into Chicago public schools in the 70s and 80s and everything you're imagining about that is probably a little bit dead on. But I went to school with people from 22 different countries. And most people didn't speak English and nobody had any money. And we just figured it out. And I think that's something as kids, you just figure out how to communicate with each other. Yeah. And that shaped everything. People are just people. It, celebrate the differences number one the food that everyone brought to school for lunch was the most celebrated difference and and you just start there awesome and then i presume you've had a couple jobs careers in between that led that uh learning from public school onward yes a few, a few jobs i worked at the at a hot dog stand that was made famous on the show roseanne darlene used to wear the flukies t-shirt i have worked at flukies um, hated every minute of that, but I worked, um, I was actually a journalist. I have a degree in journalism. So I wrote for three different papers while I was in college, which was amazing because I got more experience interviewing people. I interviewed Mike Madigan when he was still at the state level. Um, I interviewed Paul Simon before he passed, which was an unbelievable, amazing politician of his time. And again, that interaction with people, I managed apartment buildings when I was 23 years old I still can't figure out who thought it would be a great idea to give a 23 year old their billion dollar asset but okay that's what I did back then um I ran a construction department for a real estate group I used to be able to tell you how many BTUs a human put out so if your conference room had nine people what size air conditioner did you need <laughs> I used to know that don't remember it anymore okay and and so all of that experience and more that you haven't mentioned yet has led you to a place where, you know, you help people be successful, you help them communicate, you help them, you know, take on what they want to take on. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what yeah. you do, and then uh, some of the kind of key learnings that you've learned about that along the way. The communication that you've mentioned has always been the key. So my best corporate experience where I spent most of my corporate life was in the long-term care insurance industry. And basically what I did was my official fancy side, I put together regional national relationships between insurance companies and the people who sold the insurance and we were in the middleman. Okay, great. But more personally, what I did was I taught financial planners, part of that was teaching financial planners how to sell long-term care insurance to their clients and why it was important, which basically comes down to teaching financial service professionals how to sell a product they hate to people who don't want to talk about the problem. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. And so, I mean, I, I'm trying to find the parallel to that because there's the selling the stuff you hate and then there's having those uncomfortable conversations it's, it's, that's exactly it it's difficult conversations the cool. the parallel the absolute what i learned was in that process you know we went really deep in marketing i have an mba in marketing so i was always like what's the marketing here and when i left corporate and had my franchise it was in that same arena the 
main thing I learned, and I will tell you, this is about your health. It's about your relationships. It's about your leadership. It's everything you can think of. Avoiding a difficult conversation doesn't make it not happen. It just means when it happens, it's going to be at the most inopportune time and you are going to have a lack of options on how to resolve the problem. Okay, tell me more. <laughs> You're looking at me like, I mean, if we want to put it in a corporate setting, right? If let, let's, that's where most people live. Let's put it in the place of a job. If you're a manager and you're unhappy with what your team is doing, but you're not comfortable, either you're not comfortable talking to them about it, or you don't know how to have a useful conversation that has the outcomes that you want. What happens? You get more and more and more resentful of somebody and then they get, and then you fire them. Well, that didn't solve the problem. That's about the most expensive way you can go about solving that problem. And the, the flip side is true as well. If you are a team member in some capacity, we all are, right? If you are a team member and you're having issues with whatever's going on at levels above you and you don't have a way to express that, what happens? First, you check out mentally, which means you're now a disengaged employee. So you're costing money, not making money for the business, which is not anybody's job. And then eventually you leave and that can hurt the company, but it also could potentially hurt you. Yeah, right? Nobody, absolutely. It's oh, a lose absolutely. Lose, right? Well it's interesting. I mean, I, I literally just got out of a, a meeting where, I mean, I get out of meetings all the time as a facilitator. You know, a lot of the problems that get created are because people aren't talking to each other. People are not confronting what they want to because it's uncomfortable. And I tell people, it's like you pay now or you pay later. You always pay if there's something like that. And right. the kind of trajectory, it's not going to resolve itself unless you you deal with it. So, um you know, in mentoring people, in supporting people, how do you support them in having those uncomfortable, you know, conversations, whether it's about work, whether it's about uh, end of life care, whether it's about something, something else, you know, what are some of the key tenants to be able to have those uncomfortable conversations early um, so that you, they don't happen at the most inopportune time? The thing I think that throws most people, and there's several, right? If we break it down a few different things, most people, difficult conversations, kind of like business plans, they have to be reverse engineered. They have to be reverse engineered. So I always start with, what do you want? What do you want? What are you trying to get out of the conversation? What's the end goal? Because most people live in reaction mode. Most people live hands down in reaction mode. Something frustrates them, they react to it. They don't like something, they react to it. And they don't stop to think, well, what do I ultimately want? Because what I've learned the hard way, like you don't learn lessons the easy way because otherwise, they I mean, you just don't. We don't, we're human. Humans are messy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? Like we don't learn lessons the easy way. We learn lessons the hard way. And what I've learned the hard way is I can't control anybody else. I have zero influence ultimately over what anybody else does. I can only affect me. So if I want a certain outcome or before you go reacting to a situation, if I can take a step back and say, okay, what do I want to have happen? Do I want the other person to apologize to me or do I just want them to knock it off and do what they need to do? Because one of those is all about my ego. And the other one is about an outcome that might be better for everybody. It's funny how those two get conflated because you you <clears throat> can very easily blame the other person, but blaming the other person doesn't actually resolve the thing. In fact, it's what I recommended somebody was, you know, just take the ownership yourself and then you can actually Every say, time. hey, what do I want to do about it? Every time, because... And Here's the thing. The first time someone explained to me that I was responsible for every relationship I had, I was going through a divorce and I was 
really, really sure that I was not responsible, right? I mean, but it was true. How do I show up? What do I want? And am I thinking about that? Like, here's the thing. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about growing your business. We're talking about a career. You should not be doing those things in reaction mode. You should never be doing those things. So if I take a step back, I'll give you a, a more personal experience. I was at a family gathering a few months ago, and it was a difficult time for me because we moved. My dog that I had had forever had just died like the day before we moved. I was exhausted and overwhelmed, and I wanted to be there for part of it, but I also knew there was going to be people there that not my favorite people in the world. And I literally, I did this every day I was there, not once and done, but every day I was there, I was like, okay, what do I want? Well, I want these X number of people to stop being jerks. And that's like mild, right? To stop being jerks. Well, I can't have that because I have no control over that. All right. So right out of my negotiation class, what's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement? If I can't have what I want, what can I have? Well, I wanted my stepdad, who's 90 years old, to be happy. It was his birthday. I wanted him to be happy, protect him. Okay, how could I affect that? All right, well, that meant, and I literally wrote it out daily because I had to get it out. Right? I had to let things go. I had to forgive people for their faults. I had to not be so sensitive. You're, right? I, had to, I wrote it all out so that in the moment, I was no longer in reaction mode. I did what I call setting my stage. I set my stage by reminding myself what I actually wanted to have happen. And I did it every single day because I was too tired. I knew I wasn't in my best place. So I did it every day that I was there just to give myself a leg up on not opening my mouth the way that I might've been inclined to open my mouth otherwise. <laughs> Raise it's um, got to be intentional. No, I love that. If, if I may, and just for everybody listening, like there's some really, I mean, it's obviously all good stuff, but some people look at communication and inner power as something really, really soft. And what I really liked about what you did, Aaron, is you, you compared it early on to as if it was a business plan. Like, it's it's a uh, I use the word communication strategy, which is not the right words, but you're like, I'm entering an environment that is harsh. In this case, you're right you know, with reunion. opportunity to be a lunatic. Right? Yes. Like, it was just going to set me off <laughs> and, and, and fully OK to do that. But you said, OK, like, what do I want as my outcome? What do I need to do to make that happen? You like mentally set yourself like you prepared like you would preparing for an interview like what you would prepare for you know certain situations and I think it's just such a good reminder to all of us is that in your corporate setting in your family setting in your friend setting there's certain conversations that take a lot of juice and you can prepare for it but I, I, the biggest thing I want to highlight is it's the intentionality that you brought with it it was the focus it was the strategy it was the outcomes that no matter what happened, you wouldn't be less prepared. Your ability to be prepared for that situation supported you in driving the outcome, which in this case was helping a 90 year old person enjoy, you know, one of the most momentous days of their life. And you could have shown in and said, Rick, everybody. And I'm going to, you know, I'm entitled to my feelings, but instead you really stood for what was important to you. And I think that that's critical for a leader, critical for an employee, critical for a teammate, critical for a spouse to be able to support good relationships around you. So like anything you want to say about that, that's just like what I took. Well, I think one of the things you just said was I have the right to my feelings and that's a hundred percent true, but at the same time, at what cost or to what end? And I think too much, you know, when you're influenced too much about social media, I know my truth and all that. Well, yeah, great. Because I don't know if you've caught on by now, but I am extremely direct and I have my opinions. Like there's no wobble in me. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. I'm not a hesitant person. I don't have room for a lot of nonsense that I don't agree with, but I also don't think I have any right at all to inflict my opinion on someone else. They have just as much right to their opinions and their feelings and their thoughts as I have 
to mine. And I think that is where we miss the boat. I can have mine and you can have yours. And what's unfortunate now is we see too much of people thinking that those two worlds can't live together. And there's times when, you know, and we're not talking about the extremes, certain opinions are wrong. Certain opinions are wrong. Certain behaviors are wrong. Certain activities are wrong. Period, hard stop, no exceptions. But that's not the norm, right? We're talking about normal conversations or in the frame of a normal a, a normal framework, a normal life. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think that's so critical. I think it's a, it's a lifelong lesson that people can take in. And it's I'm sure it's one of those lessons that you learned, again, the hard way but it's been so impactful and rewarding. And that's why you, you still use it. Like I hadn't even heard about it like that, of course, in different I ways. But I think, yeah, <laughs> perfect. Insane. Yeah. Everything in life is made up. So I'm glad that you made that one up. Um, let's continue along the path. Like if you say like, what are the things that, you know, you mentioned mentorship when we talked before that you were there to mentor people, you know, in addition to kind of being, I call it in control for lack of a better word of your emotions, you know, what's something else that you think that leaders, you know, experienced or otherwise um, could benefit from doing more of? What would you, you know, recommend to them? What would you advise <laughs> that has brought you success in your in your life and career? All right. I wrote an article. So the, the I'll back it up for you a second. The current business is called Conquer Your Business. Before that, it was called Conquer the Conversation. So I was working on multi-generational communication, interactions, and things like that. What I learned very quickly was I didn't want to be in the middle of everybody's difficult conversation for the rest of my life. So I switched gears, right? So I switched gears. However, during that time, one of the articles that I wrote for leaders, which was hard-hitting and, and, and got some interesting response, was ask yourself as a leader this question. What is it like to be on the receiving end of you? <laughs> what is it like? Like, and I'm going to, let's be selfish for a minute. Let's be massively manipulative and selfish. If you change your behavior, you get more of what you want. Don't even come from a good leadership, altruistic, yay, everybody. It, you can come at it from the exact other side. Manipulative, selfish. I just want what I want. Okay, how do I, well, what do I have to do to get what I want? What is it like to be on the receiving end of you? Does it get you what you want? I mean, it's so easy to look at what you believe and how you act. Because all you have to do is look around you and you see the results of what you believe and how you act. And if you don't like the what you have around you, you have to change what you believe and you have to change how you act. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you, like, I don't know, that was, a, you know, a general question for people to reflect on. You know, what is the method? When do you do that? Do you do it all the time? Do you do it when you all the time? Toilet, you all the time. Okay, great. I'm like, the that's... biggest, like I debrief everything. We, we, I measure in debrief, like every time we have an event in my business, what worked, what didn't work, what worked, what, every time I do any kind of strategic planning, what's working well, where's our room for improvement? And it's all a reflection in yourself. You can do that. If you just take a couple of minutes, like if you really want to excel, and here's the, the cool thing right now, is you have several, I'll call it two or three, some, <laughs> several, some generations who haven't been taught communication as a leader. They just haven't. I mean, this is not, they're not bad for not knowing it. They weren't taught it. So if this, this is a skill that if you can develop, your career is going to skyrocket because you're going to stand out. And if you take a couple of minutes before any meeting, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, whether it's a one-on-many meeting and say, okay, what do I want to get out of this? Figure that out and say, who do I need to be in order to create that outcome? 
And then take your three to five minutes as you grab your cup of coffee after a meeting and grade yourself. Now, the most difficult conversation you can have is an honest conversation with yourself. So there's going to be some of that. If you're delusional, this doesn't work as well. But if you take a few minutes of honest reflection, and if you really want to get brave, ask somebody. Like, be prepared. <laughs> but if you really want to get brave, ask. How'd that go for you? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm sure just like mine did, my like stomach curled up into itself <laughs> hearing that. But I think it's probably a really good indicator that that's an exercise worth doing in order to really get at the depth of your leadership. So folks, as you're listening, if you want to really improve, and I tell people, you know, a senior leader, 80%, 90% of your leadership is communication. If you really want to improve yourself, you know, what's it like being on the other end of you? I love being selfish because then you can really get to the heart of being effective because effective and selfish just means you get what you want. And as a leader, you're only measured in efficacy. Um, Aaron, as we wrap up here today, because I've just been so enjoying the conversation, but I want that, like that's what I want people to leave it on. Um, where can people connect with you? Because I just, I want to leave them on a cliffhanger on that one because it's so good. <laughs> Like, I just don't want to, I just like full point stop. Like you gave two just punch you in the stop. face. Season Hard two. Stop. I think so because it's so good. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't want to lose it. Like check, like re-listen to this, check yourself majorly. These two pieces on communication. I know you don't want to be owning in the middle of tough conversations because that sucks too. But everything in your life relates to the two principles that Aaron shared and if you want to be a better person, you want to be a better leader, it's so critical. So Aaron, as we finish up, where can people connect with you to continue this conversation with you? Where can they learn more about you? And if there's anything else you want to say in closing, please, the floor is yours. Awesome. So it's real easy. The website is conqueryourbusiness.com. Everything you need is there. We have our podcast is there. So you can listen to tons of conversations as well. Conqueryourbusiness.com. Something to leave people with. Every single thing you want is on the other side of improving your ability to communicate with other humans. Like, seriously. Wait, full stop. Full stop. I love it. Aaron, thank you for chatting with me today. It's been such a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the next time. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Folks, this has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today has been Aaron Marcus, who's the founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business. Everything you want in life is at the other end of your mouth, so long as you're using it well. And I think that's a great rep rem reminder for every single person. So be careful how you use it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Like, subscribe, do all the things. My name's Anthony Taylor. I'll see you next time.